Hotel Royal, which later became, was renamed the, the Hotel Pnom. It was really the center of information for the, for the whole world. The Khmer Rouge had taken anything of value out of the hotel. It was a haven from the war. Cambodia, a land of plains and rivers on the Indo-Chinese mainland of Southeast Asia. Many buildings in the capital Phnom Penh reflect its French colonial past, including this hotel. The Cambodian or Khmer Empire dominated the whole region a thousand years ago and visitors still come to marvel at the Angkor Wat temple, the largest religious complex in the world. But in the 20th century, war raged in Indochina for nearly 30 years, and the Cambodian Civil War led to a genocide now world famous for its killing fields. When journalists arrived to cover the conflict, they stayed at this imposing old hotel. I was posted to Cambodia, to the capital city Phnom Penh, um, in the beginning of May 1970. And I stayed in the uh, Hotel Royal, which later became, was renamed the, the Hotel Phnom um, by the new government. Hotel Le Phnom became a media hub but it was also home from home for a host of reporters, photographers, cameramen, and local fixers. Big hotel, colonial style, French hotel, wonderful baronial style building with a beautiful garden in the back with a swimming pool, high ceilinged, all antique. And it was, so it was a great place to relax in when one had come back from the front lines of Cambodia when the, when the war already got going. John Swain came to Phnom Penh to cover the Civil War. But to understand Cambodia then, you have to look back to its independence from France in 1953. Soon after independence, war broke out in neighboring Vietnam between the communist North supported by China and the Soviet Union and the government of the South backed by the United States. At first, the Cambodian King Sihanouk chose neutrality but in 1963, he did a deal with the North Vietnamese to allow them to station troops in Cambodia. This ultimately led to the US bombing Cambodia for four years from 1969 to 1973. King Sihanouk lost power in a coup secretly backed by the US in 1970. His replacement, Prime Minister Lon Nol, headed the right-wing pro-US Khmer Republic. In revenge, the deposed king in exile supported his former enemies, the communist Khmer Rouge, headed by Pol Pot. This triggered the ferocious civil war, which pitted the Khmer Rouge and the exiled Prince Sihanouk's National Front against Lon Nol's government forces. This was when Western journalists began to cover Cambodia as well as Vietnam, and Lu Royal, renamed as Lu Phnom, became Cambodia's war hotel. NBC's Jim Laurie was also posted to Phnom Penh. I initially went to Cambodia in 1970, less than a month after I had arrived in Saigon. At that time, President Richard Nixon launched an invasion of Cambodia in April of 1970. I got to, uh, to Phnom Penh. Once again, I was too poor to stay at the luxury Royale Hotel, 
which changed its name later to the Le Penam because the government that was installed was anti-royalist. After the coup and removal of Sihanouk in 1970, Cambodia became a huge battleground. Lon Nol's government forces attacked and massacred ethnic Vietnamese and Cambodians who supported the communist Khmer Rouge. At the same time, the communists under their leader Pol Pot gained more support and responded with equal violence. Journalists were increasingly vulnerable whenever they left the sanctuary of Le Penom and ventured out to the front line. Kate Webb from United Press International was kidnapped by the Khmer Rouge, assumed dead, but reappeared 23 days later. As I said, it was a haven, haven from the war already. And it was a joy to come back there. We would, uh, ideally, we would find all our colleagues back there. They would be alive and well. Um, but sometimes, as I said, uh, we would come back and we'd find that five or six colleagues hadn't returned. And in a two-month period when I was there, uh, 20 journalists, uh, more than 20 journalists, uh, were killed or mis went missing, and they're obviously dead, um, by being ambushed by the Khmer Rouge. Two journalists were killed by the Khmer Rouge, crossing the notorious Route 2 on the 28th of October 1970. I can recall a, a, a terrible incident when a journalist called Frank Frosch, who worked for United Press International, disappeared with a very famous Japanese Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer, Kaiwashi Sawada. And they were both ambushed uh, down the road. And uh, a fellow journalist, um, woman journalist on, with U United Press International, Kate Webb, uh, who's also very famous, um, she, she had to identify Frank's body. She couldn't write the story for UPI. She was too upset to write it. And uh, a wonderful man, uh, a reporter for Associated Press um, called John Wheeler, who was in competition with her uh, because he worked for the Associated Press, she worked for United Press International. He wrote the story for her and uh, for UPI and put her name on it. The civil war gradually intensified as the Khmer Rouge gained ground at the expense of government forces. When the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 1973, ending the Vietnam War, Lon Nol announced a unilateral ceasefire. But the Khmer Rouge ignored it and pressed on towards Phnom Penh. So the United States ramped up their bombing campaign, Operation Freedom Deal. In its last days, US planes dropped over 250,000 tons of bombs, killing thousands of Khmer Rouge fighters. One of the few journalists able to get into Cambodia at that time was a young French photographer who went on to take the most iconic pictures of the fall of Phnom Penh. With a friend together, we, in 1973, I mean, we decided to fly to Cambodia and uh, see firsthand uh, what was, you know, what is working into war zone. So eventually we arrive in the a, in a summer in, uh, in Phnom Penh and um, just in time to see the last uh, B-52 carpet bombing. It's not simple when you get in, into a country, you have to figure out, you, you have to find where are the other reporters, I mean, where you, you need information, and you need to really kind of uh, uh, understand what's going on. And in fact, um, uh, sure enough, I mean, there was one place in Phnom Penh where you, where you could get all that stuff, the Phnom. And that was uh, the, the hotel for the, the senior correspondent. And uh, it was really the center of information for the, for the whole war, you know. Through 1974 and into 1975, the Khmer Rouge moved closer to Phnom Penh and began to lay siege to the city, while the Cambodian army blocked the main roads into the capital. Living conditions deteriorated as food and water supplies were disrupted. On the 3rd of March, 1975, the Khmer Rouge shelled Phnom Penh and Pochentong Airport indiscriminately, killing many civilians. 
this rocket attack outside the Monorom Hotel killed 11 people, and Le Pnom also fell under fire. I do remember when rockets were falling around the hotel. I mean, we had, you know, the Khmer Rouge, they were firing rockets from about five to ten miles away outside of the, the city. And everybody rushing back at the hotel, you know, they say, you know, we're under attack, so, you, you know, like huddled around the, the, the reception area to, 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 to be safe, you know. As the Khmer Rouge tightened its grip on the capital, Prime Minister Lon Nol fled to Indonesia, while Jim Laurie came back to Phnom Penh. I returned to Cambodia again in 1975. I arrived and covered the final days of the, of the uh, basically a very sad uh, decline of any chance that the Cambodians had to withstand the Khmer Rouge. As the communists advanced, the US launched a dramatic airlift. Operation Eagle Pull began on the 12th of April 1975, and the Americans evacuated hundreds of their own citizens and Cambodians from the country. Meanwhile, the mood inside Le Pnom grew more tense for both the Cambodian staff and the journalists. The last time I really had a breakfast uh, in, in Phnom Penh then was at the hotel, and that was on the day the American uh, evacuation. It was kind of a secret, you know, it's, it's being passed on to the journalists. And some had been told, OK, you want to leave, pack your thing and go to the embassy. There was a danger by staying because the Khmer Rouge had asked all the foreigners to leave. And the thing, so we were being warned that we had to leave, I mean, in a way. So I, I had decided to stay. Jim Laurie and many other foreign correspondents, however, decided it was time to leave. Laurie filmed his journey on an 8mm camera. Well, I left on the 12th of April 1975 on a helicopter from Phnom Penh off into the Gulf of Thailand onto the USS Okinawa, one of a number of uh, American ships that were there for the Cambodian evacuation, who were then later repositioned for the Vietnam evacuation. Journalists shuttled between Vietnam and Cambodia. Despite warnings of the impending danger, John Swain arrived back in Phnom Penh. I arrived at the Hotel Phnom, and uh, there I immediately bumped into Sidney Shanberg of the New York Times, Al Rockoff, the freelance photographer who had done a lot of work for Sydney in the New York Times, um, and Sydney's interpreter, Dit Pran. Um, so we teamed up as a band and um, covered the last days of Phnom Penh um, as the Khmer Rouge moved in. As the siege got tighter um, in the last three or four days, refugees started crowding around the hotel because they felt safer in the presence of Westerners. And the Red Cross um, took over the hotel and declared it an international zone and then started letting Cambodians in who wanted to shelter. And so the hotel, suddenly the grounds, very spacious grounds, uh, were occupied by a mass of people. Here's a, the hotel, the, the Phnom. When they decide to make it as a open uh, for, for everybody, so the refugee walking through the lobby of the hotel. In the middle of this, there was a Scottish medical team working for the Red Cross. Uh, one of my vivid memories of that period was um, going in to see them and talk to them and they were operating on a very badly wounded Cambodian soldier who'd been brought in there um, and he died on, on the table. I mean, it was not an operating table at all. It was just a, a hotel table with a, with a sheet over it and, um, and, he, and, he, and he died. Um, but they were doing their best. They were absolutely doing... Everyone was doing their best to help other, everyone else, really. I walked by the hotel in, um, I think that was a Wednesday uh, afternoon, and there was very few people over there, only like a, a few staff. Uh, and uh, and refugees were like scattered into the, the, the garden and um, you know, near the pool and everything. There was, it was very quiet, really very quiet. 
This was when Neveu photographed the mass exodus from Phnom Penh on the boulevard outside the hotel. The Khmer Rouge claimed the Americans were about to bomb the city and ordered everyone to leave. Many thousands of Cambodians who left that day never returned to their homes. On the last day, I mean, everybody was pouring into town. I mean, all the people, I mean, living around the edges of, of, of Phnom Penh were pouring into town, like escaping the firefight. And uh, my picture on the on evening, you know, where Monivong is totally, is blackened with people, is full of people, you know, just not knowing where to go. All foreigners in Phnom Penh were being told to go to the French embassy. So we rushed back to the hotel, um, which was, in a chaotic scene, as I remember, um, the, the, the Cambodians who'd been refugees, who'd been sheltering there, were also leaving because the Khmer Rouge had ordered the, everyone in the city to move out into the countryside. They were evacuating the city. John Swain, Sidney Shanberg, Al Rockoff and Dith Pran spent that night in the post office near the hotel. We came back to the hotel early in the morning uh, to a very atmosphere, eerie atmosphere, where uh, people were very frightened. They knew, these are the Cambodians, they knew who were living in the hotel and also the Cambodian staff. They knew that uh, the city was falling, that the Khmer Rouge could arrive uh, at any time. Uh, the last minutes I spent, or we spent in the hotel, uh, were really very distressing um, because we were, we were leaving the hotel, which had been our home for five years, uh, five tumultuous years when we'd um, seen lots of things, but we'd also had a lot of fun and we'd grown to know and love the staff. And it was um, with a terrible sense of abandonment. Um, and the staff uh, were clutching us, imploring us uh, uh, not to leave. Um, and uh, suddenly we were turning the, our backs on them. Sorry. So it was, it, it, was a, it was a difficult time to leave, um, but uh, we, there was, you know, we had to go and we couldn't take them with us. Um, and you dip into these countries um, and uh, you, you, you can leave, but you leave people behind. Um, so. The Khmer Rouge gave everyone in the hotel just half an hour to leave. Roland Neveu was already at the French embassy. What's happened on the 17th, the fighting started very, very early on that day, like I think around four o'clock in the morning, it was the last fighting in, all around the embassy. And uh, we saw the first Khmer Rouge walking to the, this open area, I think it's around nine o'clock in the morning. Neveu took these dramatic pictures of the fall of Phnom Penh. Swain, Shanberg, Rokoff and Dith Pran joined the nearly 600 other people taking refuge in the French embassy. The Khmer Rouge ordered all the Cambodians to leave. Dith Pran's life was at stake. His friends tried to save him by forging one of John Swain's spare passports. I had a second passport, British passport, and um, so I thought uh, that uh, he, we could pretend that he was Nepalese, and we, so we could have a British passport as a Nepalese. So we changed my name around, and we stripped off my photograph on the passport, and he had a picture, a mugshot of himself, so we stuck that over. And then Pran decided, well, he would take his chances and just leave. It was best for him, and he didn't want to be the last Cambodian to leave, so he left with one of the last groups. Um, it was very emotional. Um, Sydney broke down. I think I broke down. Um, we all hugged each other. And he uh, walked out um, through the gates of the embassy uh, into the unknown and disappeared for the best part of four years. Dith Pran spent those four years in Khmer Rouge labor camps. Before escaping to Thailand in 1979, 
where he was reunited with Sidney Shanberg, and the two went to the US together. Dith Pran died there in 2008. Sidney Shanberg won the Pulitzer Prize for his Cambodia coverage in 1976 and died in 2016. But they and their story, along with John Swain and Al Rockoff, were immortalized in the 1984 Oscar-winning film, The Killing Fields. Two weeks after Pran left, the journalists in the French embassy were evacuated to Thailand. Hotel Le Pnom fell into disrepair and remained closed for several years. Jim Laurie returned to Cambodia in 1979. Le Pnom had become the base for several international relief agencies, and Laurie took these rare pictures of the hotel he still called Le Royal. I happen to be among the first journalists to arrive in Cambodia after the Vietnamese had expelled the Khmer Rouge in January of 1979. I arrived in April of 1979, and I stayed for the first time at the Royal Hotel in Phnom Penh. It was a mess. The Khmer Rouge had taken anything of value out of the hotel. They had even removed the mirrors. The water was not working. We had to go down to the swimming pool area to get water to bathe. The Vietnamese military had taken over the hotel. They were using the swimming pool and they would stock the pool with fish. So we had fresh fish to eat in the evening at the hotel. By this time, uh, they had decided to change the name of the hotel one more time. And they called it the Samaki Hotel, which in Khmer meant solidarity between Cambodia and Vietnam. It was only in the 1990s that the uh, Royal Hotel was returned to its former splendor when it was totally renovated by a Singaporean firm. It took Cambodia years to recover from the cruel legacy of the Khmer Rouge. And over one and a half million people are buried in these killing fields. Phnom Penh was gradually rebuilt, people returned to live there, and in 1993, Hotel Le Pnom was restored to the glitz of its glory days and renamed Le Royal. The hotel uh, certainly deserves the title War Hotel. It was, it was a haven from the war, uh, as well as being a war hotel. It was a, it was a haven. It was a, it was a place that we uh, journalists um, regarded as home. 37 journalists were killed during the Cambodian Civil War. In February 2003, many correspondents returned to Cambodia to unveil a stone memorial bearing the names of their fallen colleagues. The UPI journalist Kate Webb continued to cover conflicts in Asia until 2001. She died in Australia in 2007. Nearly half a century on from the war, John Swain, Roland Neveu and Jim Laurie continue to write and talk about their life-defining experiences in Cambodia and, of course, at Hotel Le Pnom. Covering the war is, um, I mean, it can be very risky for yourself, but also when you lose your friend and everything, so it's even more like... Uh, 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 harming them for your life. In my particular case, I had very good friends in Cambodia who got trapped behind. Two survived, three did not survive, but at least two of them did survive. One I was able to get out of Cambodia years, years later. And I kept coming back to Indochina time and again, and I think that it'll always be the central part of my life. Well, it's it, it, that whole experience of five years in Cambodia and Vietnam uh, was, for me, the most important period of my life. I saw life at its roughest, uh, its most wretched, 
It's most miserable. But I also saw life at its deepest, really. Um, so it mattered. Um, and um, so it's it's, some, it's something which I, I, I carry forever um, within me. Mm -hmm.